appreciate uh, the singing uh, and uh, music ministry. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks so much, Bowman and Bob, for uh, welcoming me in the Trinity service. And always good to be together. So um, it is uh, a happy Sunday indeed. So, uh, but uh, I did want to just share a, a few things. Go, go ahead and turn to uh, John 11. Uh, that's where we're going to be today. Uh, that's no surprise whatsoever. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but while you're turning there, uh, I just wanted to share a few things. One, I just, uh, you know, past, present, and future, since uh, we started meeting together after COVID, which has now been quite a while now, there's been a lot of people that have served in the children's ministry. Uh, and so uh, if you served in the children's ministry at all in that time frame, please just stand up. We just want to thank you guys so much. So, so I have two kids, so I am uh, extremely, extremely thankful for you guys doing that, and for those that are up there at this moment, so, um, but you guys uh, help immensely, and uh, it's super, super important, so thank you for doing that. Um, also, uh, on, at our midweek that we had this past Wednesday, uh, it was really, really important midweek. Uh, we had a really informative, really good discussion about the Belmont building and what's going on with that. We, we talked about how we started initially having a relationship uh, with them and, 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 and uh, using the building uh, to where we are now. We talked about numbers, we talked finances, we talked uh, about a whole bunch of things. And, uh, and, and so uh, it, was, it was really, really helpful, I think. Uh, there was a lot of feedback given from the church. Uh, so if you want, uh, if, if uh, we did record it, uh, it is not online yet, but, um, but uh, if you really get a chance to be there for whatever circumstances you have going on, uh, I highly recommend uh, listening to it. So we, we try to be as thorough as possible and have this really good discussion about that. So, uh, so uh, be on the lookout for that. I will probably just put it out on our YouTube channel and, uh, and this will just be audio so it won't be video at all. But uh, if it's something to listen to, uh, it'll be like a podcast. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyways, uh, one other thing too that I did want to just uh, touch upon uh, with uh, flannel sets. Uh, thank you for all those that have worn flannels already today. Uh, apparently we're all, we're all prepared and ready for that, so that's great. Uh, but one thing I did want to mention too is the farm. Uh, there's hay rides, there's uh, scavenger hunts, there's, there's uh, uh, all kinds of stuff going on over there. There's coordinators and everything like that. Uh, that is an additional uh, admission for that. So, but they would love for you guys to stay afterwards, uh, after the after we're done with our cookout and everything, and just uh, go enjoy yourselves and and uh, buy some pumpkins and and, uh, and have a good time. I believe it's nine dollars for all the uh, additional stuff going on there. But just wanted to let, let you guys know that that is uh, a separate thing uh, going on there. Uh, but it's really it's really nice, and uh, apparently uh, it's perfect timing for the panel. Because uh, last week we weren't thinking panels, and now we are. So, yeah. Yeah. so uh, but, uh, but let's go ahead, and, and we're in John 11, and we're going to go ahead and uh, read there. Please sign up for the Chili Cook-Off as well, uh, so that we can uh, have this great time out there. Okay. So, um, but in John 11, uh, like Bob said, there's a ton in this passage, a ton. Uh, we could uh, spend a lot of time on this chapter, but uh, we're, we're just going to spend this Sunday on a piece of this chapter in John 11. So we're going to actually uh, pick it up in John 17. You know, we're going to be, uh, starting to that. So John 11, verse 17. So here we go. It says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. What a great theme, right? That's a, that's a, that's a perfect theme. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though... They die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered the village, but 
was still at the place where Martha had met her. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, accompanying her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn for them. When, Jesus, when, when, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man and kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. And I have actually read my passage, so I'm going to stop right there. It's a good passage, isn't it? Yeah. Why don't you go with that? So there you go. But uh, so, you know, in, in this passage, Jesus says an I am statement. And this is actually the fifth I am statement he's made in the book of John. Um, so prior to this, he said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the good shepherd, I'm the gate, I'm the light of the world, right? And so after these, state, these statements, they're all extremely, extremely significant. Uh, you know, we, we must, they're so, they're so significant what Jesus is trying to say here, say, you must be consumed with me. You need to be consumed by me. In order to follow him and to call yourselves his followers, to call yourselves disciples, consume me as much as possible. There's never a, uh, oh, I'm too filled, I'm too stuck. There, yeah. there, there's nothing, yes, that's what you want when it comes to Jesus. Yeah. And so because of that, we've got to listen to and follow him because he is the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. And he is the great protector. And he is all the great I am statements that he's already said. I think we must live in the light as he is in the light. And our theory is in the book of God is to rise to the light of life. Right? He is the light. And here he says that he is the resurrection and life. That's the statement he makes here. And that is the statement, man, that statement takes the case over all these other statements. I am the resurrection and life. You know, resurrection in the Greek, it actually literally means to stand up. It means to rise. The sense of getting up after falling down. Not because I always love that message. Yeah. You know, Jesus goes beyond the common belief and tells Martha that the power of the resurrection exists in Him. Yeah. It exists in Him. Jesus gives hope of resurrection in the future as a result of the future resurrection and triumph that He goes through. So we are meant to and able to live resurrected lives today. And he doesn't just stop with this resurrection. He doesn't say, I am the resurrection. He just, he, he puts a cherry on top or forget cherry, I was thinking, the, whatever, the greatest thing you can think of that you saw on top of a dessert. He puts it up there and he goes, oh, and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. He also includes the life. We all want to live the life, right? How many people are you here that you talk to? Maybe it's on a weekly basis. How's it going? Living the life. I'm living the life. We always want to live the life. I think the problem is our interpretation of what that means and what Jesus means is probably quite different. Yeah, yeah. When people say, I'm living the life, I'm not sure they're talking about the life that Jesus is talking about. Right. I'm, really, I, I, I'm not sure. So life had an entirely different meaning before we started living in Christ, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. When you think about before you became a Christian, what was the life? Living the life. What thoughts did you what, what thoughts talk to mind? What things consumed your ideas and your worldview? You know? But even living in Christ, the life, can actually, sadly, take on a meaning of its not much to take. A meaning that it shouldn't take. And so the life, you know, it isn't only as much as you can. You know, there's sometimes when Laura and I talk about buying something, we want, we, we, we want to own something more, and I'm like, 
Your Foley's are probably a little harder to swallow actually right now, which is actually a better thing than some of them. My my Foley's already done for the year. You got some. <laughs> but how many of us here we, we make these if only statements to God? If only you would relieve my pain. If only you wouldn't have allowed my father, my brother, my sister, my mother, my, my, my aunt, my uncle, my child. If only, if only you would have helped me find a job, a job I liked, a job where there were no issues, a job where I liked the people, I liked my boss, my boss liked me, and I had enough PTO to go do what I wanted to do. When you find that job, you let me know. Yeah. If only I didn't have to deal with that person anymore. And you might not even saw that person two years ago. You call back in your mind. If only I could get, you know, get that house. If only life wasn't so hard. Waiting for God to work out the if only. It's not really a smart place to be when you come to your relationship. It's not a good place to stay and hang out. Don't let that be the spot where you're just kind of still. Don't binge on that. A relationship with him, it isn't a negotiation. Because he, he's Lord. He's Lord. Right? He's Lord. And so yet, Mary and Martha both approach him as Lord, don't they? They say Lord to him. They say Lord to him. But when I think about their culture, and this if only mentality, I think our culture has gotten way worse. Because here, I guess, okay, you just lost your brother. I get that. But man, our culture, I want it now. Yeah. yeah. Type of culture. Fast food culture, right? Which I don't know about you, but I feel like fast food's gotten slower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you have to wait yeah. to get it. Like, that's how bad it, like that, I'm like, whoa, fast food ain't fast food anymore. Yeah, right. Like, we'll, we'll call you up with a dreading. Call me up. Where's my friend? I take it from the counter and I go sit down. I want it now. Is this fast food? Yeah. Is yeah. that good? Yeah. Yeah. Something's changed. I don't like it. Yeah. Give me my food. Drive-through pharmacies. I thought about that. Remember the drive-through soda yeah. places where you go get your Kodak sodas and you drive up and get them? They don't have drive-through. We actually lost a drive-through. We don't have drive-through soda places anymore. We have drive-through pharmacies, so maybe you can do that, right? There's grocery pickup. There's curbside pickup. And hey, if that's too slow, you can go in and grab it if you want, but you got to walk 20 steps to get there. And then you got to walk 20 steps back. So it's up to you. But you can get it however you want to get it. There's 30 minute cookbooks. Because you don't want to take the time, although thank you, Tony and Glenn, and for the, for the guys that take the time slowly marinating things, weighing and chilling. I appreciate that. It always gets better when you just take the time. 30 minute cookbooks. And we have this mentality the faster, the better. The faster, the better. And the thing is, the faster and better often leads to a lot of mistakes. It often leads to a lot of. Lack of Holy Spirit quality. That if we're Christians in Jesus to be repented and baptized, we have those qualities. But the faster the better, those qualities get diminished. You know, Lauren, she lives in Roanoke, she doesn't live in Roanoke, she actually lives here. But she grew up, she grew up in Roanoke, Virginia. Okay? I'm hitting you with the jokes. They're not even jokes. They're like just coming out. Man. Don't even try to be jokes. Just talk about it. People are laughing. Thing is, if I didn't, if I didn't resonate on it, you guys might not even notice. But then I, I go back. Well, anyway, so we're going to Virginia. That's where Lauren grows up, right? There's this advertisement there, and I'm like, what? And there's 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 Lewis Gale Hospital, and then there's Really not right? And 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 Lewis Gale has a hospital, uh, a, an advertisement right next to like Carillion Hospital, and it says our emergency weight room is ten minutes less than than Carillion. Yeah, but it takes ten minutes to get there. Like like what? Like I, it's just a weird advertisement to me because don't you want your doctor to take their time to see you? And maybe 
your way isn't as long because your doctors aren't as good. Like, I, like, I, it's just, it's, 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 hey, you want to, I know the idea is, hey, get treated quicker, but I, I don't want to get treated quicker. I, I want people to take the time and, and, and help me with whatever I need help with. This is the emergency room. So if I'm going here, it's the emergency I get it. Go to the emergency room and put there. I get what they're saying, but there's a lot of butts that have diamond time too. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm sharing it with you now. But you know, but, but, but there's passion. There is no I want it, so I will get it. There's none of that. They had to wait four days, and now they're in mourning. And many other people have come to mourn with them. And so, you know, many of you have probably been waiting much, much longer than four days. Much longer than four days for, for, for a hope or desire you have. By the way, there's nothing wrong with having hopes. There's nothing wrong with having desires. There's nothing wrong with that. This isn't saying, hey, don't have hopes or desires anymore. That's not, that's not what this is about. Jesus, actually, he, he has no problem with their hopes and desires. That, that Lazarus is going to, he doesn't press them. He doesn't say, if, if only. Like, he doesn't. He doesn't even pay attention to that. Like, Jesus is okay with us having hopes and desires, okay? That's fine. But just because you have hopes and desires doesn't mean Jesus is going to give them to you. One, the way you want them, or two, give them to you at all. And I think we've got to remember what happens to Lazarus. It doesn't happen for Mary and Martha. It happens so God can be glorified. Right? It's not so Mary and Martha get what they want, it's so God can be glorified. Right. And so there's a little side note that could be a whole lesson there. Is when you get something you want, are you praising God? Are you going, thank you God, thank you so much for this. And you're like, yeah, this is what I want. I got it, maybe it wasn't what I wanted it, so now you already have a little bit of an attitude towards it. But, but no, uh, God, thank you. you. You gave this to me, it's amazing, and I appreciate it, and you're awesome. So here's the thing though, so you find yourself in a I want it now situation, right? Which we all have, we all have them. You know, you might have it on the way home when you go behind that slow driver. Okay, I, I just want to get around the person now. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. Maybe you begin to blame God for the situation, right? I, 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 don't, I don't know, I, I do not know. But you find yourself in a situation and you blame God for the situation but why don't you have what you want? Why don't I have it? You start asking that question. And so you get to this place where you begin to rely on the facts rather than faith in God, right? When things don't go your way, we can have a lot of things occur. We can react a lot of different ways. Maybe, maybe we get angry, right? When things don't go your way, maybe, maybe you feel discouraged, you feel a little down, you feel a little like uh, unhappy. And, and so what you end up doing is you keep fighting for that. I want that. I want that. Even though God said no, I'm, I'm going to figure out how to get that. That, I want it, so I'm going for it. I'm going to figure out how I can get it. And maybe it's just for two days. Maybe it's for two months. Maybe it's for two years. I, I don't know. And then, and then you get it. Or maybe you never get it. But here's the thing. You keep your time so hard to get it, you stop playing and you just grind to get it. You try to be seek it. You try to seek, you try to figure out how can I get this? How, how can I make this happen? How can I get what I want? There's no prayer, there's no connection with God. There's no communication, there's no approaching it in the ways of God. You become cold towards others. You become kind of accusatory towards others because they block. Or they're, they're putting up barriers, they're putting up walls, and they're not letting you get what you want. There's less and less Jesus coming out of us, or you, or me. And there's less and less of that resurrected life that Jesus has planned for all of us. Because we're so fixated on the other one in one hour. You focus on the facts, and you forget the faith. And here's the thing, it just takes faith. It takes faith to not fall into selfish ambition. It takes faith to not fall into selfish It takes faith to not fall into a self-centered life. All those sins, by the way, are sins. Selfish ambition is a sin. It takes faith to trust God when you don't get what you want. It takes faith to step away from those who pull you away from God. And go, you know what? That may help my relationship to God. Let me, let me pull away from that. Let me re-engage you. It takes faith. 
Sometimes I wish we didn't live in such a me-centric society. But I mean, somehow, I mean, that'd be so nice if it just, I just think trusting God would be much better, it'd be much easier, it'd be much simpler, but with all, we live in this culture as me, me, me. I think, man, and that just takes a lot of challenges. And it takes a lot of challenges that, you know, this, it makes life difficult, especially when we're trying to follow Jesus, and we know it's about Jesus and not about it. It's, it's challenging. It's not easy. Sometimes I'm like, man, look at this new century stuff. We sing the Burger King usual song in our family. It was one of our theme songs at camp for summer. We sang it every day, all the camp. New rule, new rule. I knew it was fun, and it's great. It's all like harder than, yeah, fun good time. But, the, the, but the, what that message is saying, not a, not a good biblical follow Jesus message right, at all. Not at all. And you know, so when God give us, doesn't give us what we want, what can we think? We can say, man, he's not answering our prayers. He's far away from us. He doesn't care about me. I must not be dying. I must not be important. And, and, and we're forgetting all the text. Even, even we're just forgetting John 11. And no, you can rise from this. You can get out of the depths and the darkness and the death that you were feeling because you're not getting what you want. And Jesus will help you rise. We're just forgetting that one chapter, let alone all the other scriptures that, that, that support that. So let me ask you this. If you're a Christian in Jesus today, did you become a Christian in you get what you want? No. Did you become a Christian to get what you want? No. No, you didn't. No, you did not. You became a Christian because you love Jesus and you proclaim Him as your Lord. And you put your life over to Him to take care of. No matter what His response is going to be, no matter how often you pleaded for something, whether it's two days or never, you never thought about the idea of compromising your faith in Him. When you became a Christian. Because you weren't thinking, ah, oh, yeah, look what I'm going to get now. You weren't, you weren't thinking, oh, yeah, it's going to be great to follow him, but man, if I don't get what I want, man, I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get so angry. Man, if I don't get what I want, it's okay if I hold things against people. Because people don't know me, and, and, and they should know, they should know these things. No, we thought, no, God knows what he's doing. I must need this. This must be good for my faith. This must be a faith test. This must be a, a, an opportunity right, to take a step of faith and go, okay, God, I trust you. I might not like it, but I trust you. We didn't think when we proclaimed Jesus the Lord and repented on God baptized, there was not a thought of us at all that, you know what? If, some, if something doesn't go my way, I'm going to stop having good spiritual relationships. Because that's not really a big deal. I know it's in the scriptures, but that's not really that big deal. We didn't think, oh, it's okay if I become less and less a part of the body of Christ and my spiritual family because I'm not getting what I want. We didn't, we didn't think those things. Those weren't thoughts we had. We didn't think I've done my time. It's time for someone else to do that. God will understand why I'm choosing this. No, none of those, none, none of those crossed our minds. And here's the thing, it's never okay to put aside the truth. It's never okay to put aside the truth. We've got to put the scriptures in front of us and go to the truth. So, is scripture guiding your decisions or not? Is faith in Jesus involved or faith in yourself or something else? What's going on? What's happening? What's occurring when you have these if only? They're going to happen, by the way. It might be happening. So here's the thing, though. It's never okay to compromise even though you, know you don't see things happening in your time. But how often is that the temptation? I'm, I'm going to compromise my faith a little bit. I'm going to compromise the truth. I'm going to just kind of tweak things a little bit. Because I just want to get some things my way. It's no longer your time. It's God's time. You don't know how much time you got. It's God's time. It's time to get rid of the if-only attitude. And there's a great way to do it, though. 
And so what helps Mary and Martha get rid of the if-only attitude is they return to the truth. They return to the truth. Mary went to Jesus. She said what she said. If only you had been here, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. I'm not saying don't say the if only. But after the if only, she returns to the truth. Yeah. Right? She returns to the truth. She began with the fact in this statement. Right? Of where she had been in her heart, where she is in her heart right now. But she didn't finish there. She expressed her faith in God's power and His ability to work through Jesus. She wasn't all the way there in her faith. But she was getting there. She turned back to the truth. But she was getting there. She wasn't stuck in this if only. Right? So how do we return to the truth as Martha did? How do we do that? Well, it's actually really simple. Be honest. Be honest. Be honest. Be honest with God about how you feel. Be honest with each other about how we feel. So we can talk. Honesty with God is good. I know. Yes, he knows how you feel already. Yes, he does. He does. But then that kind of diminishes the relationship. Yeah. Be honest with him. It helps us realize where we are in our faith and where we are in our heart. You know, there, there's times where I leave voice messages with Lauren and I'm just sharing and then I say something and I say, oh, it should be just funny. I'm just sharing and all of a sudden something comes out. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that's good. That's, that's actually really helpful. Yeah. Be, just be honest. Just, just say what needs to be said. David did it many, many ways and he did it through the song. He did it amazingly. He was honest, but he returned to the truth. He was honest. And he returns to the truth. In Psalm 10, verse 1, he says, Why, O Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Keep being honest. Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forgive me forever? Really? Really, David? Come on. Come on, David. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Psalm 13, 5. He returns to the But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Isn't this the same guy that just said, hey, you hide your face from me and you forgot about me. But then four verses later, he said, hey, my heart's going to rejoice in you. Yeah. He returns to the truth. He returns back to what he knows, to what God is, and what God will always, always be. As long as we're willing to return to the truth. So be honest. Be as honest as you need to be. David, he was honest. I think be honest with God and then return to the truth. And remember what you know. Here's just a few thoughts. Joshua 1 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. David wasn't leaving that, was he? Matthew 6 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, which takes faith, by the way. And then all those things that you're seeking first before him, go give you this. All these things will be given to you as well. And it might be different than what you think you need. It might not necessarily be the thing you want. Right. But it's going to be what, what is really helpful for you. Mm -hmm. Acts 17, 26. He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. You aren't here by accident. If you're visiting with us here today, you aren't here by accident. Think about all you know about God and His Word. You can go on and on and on about him. Just returning to the truth. Let's just, just, just stop. Just stop for a little bit right now. I just think. Right? Do the scriptures say, what does the truth say? That gives you pastor the own truth. Return to the truth, church. 
Return to the truth, brothers and sisters. John Hare, return to the truth. Jim Boney, Tracy McCauley, Doug Stevens, Michelle Stevens, Ms. Connors, Brian Hinkle. Return to the truth. Yeah. I didn't get someone over here. David Richardson, return to the truth. <laughs> so here's the thing. How else can we get rid of this if-only attitude? And my final thought is just come to the feet Jesus. Come to the feet of Jesus. Every time you find the in scriptures, where is she? That's the feet of Jesus. Here in John 11, she falls at Jesus' feet. In John 12, Jesus is at Lazarus' house, and she's wiping his feet with pure nard and her hair. In John 19, she's at the foot of the cross. We have the if only attitude again. And she expected to do that. She didn't do it proudly. And your humility in this text in John 11, she falls to Jesus' feet and says, If only. If in this Lordship, you are in control, you know what's going on. I am humble and low. You are my Lord. And I fall at your feet. Her humility and emotion moves Jesus' heart. And so in verse 33 of John 11, Jesus said, it says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit. Right? Well, this deeply moved in spirit, guess what it actually literally means in the Greek? It means to snort like a horse. That's what it means. It, so it, it generally, it kind, of, it, it kind of implies like, hey, this, this is an intense thing here. This is an overwhelming thing here. This is, this is a lot. This is too much to handle. Deeply moved in spirit. You know, Jesus, it also implies, uh, as well, generally implies this, this deeply, deeply moved in spirit, it generally implies anger. And so Jesus, he's angry. But he's not angry at the sisters in the passage. He's not angry at the mourners in the passage. He possibly was angry about death. Death that entered the world as, as, as the result of sin. And, and, and he's angry because he knows this wasn't, meant, this wasn't meant to be. And he's feeling this grief and he's seeing the morning and he, 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 it's, it's overwhelming to him. And he's, he's just angry that this is, this is where the narrative is at. And so, but he's not only deeply moved in spirit, but he's also troubled. The Greek word is parasa. And that word means, you know, it, it expresses agitation, confusion, or disorganization. Jesus is angry and agitated. He's showing his humanity in this passage, in this exact passage that we looked at twice today. He's hurt because of what people were feeling over the loss of Lazarus. Even to the point of tears. It seems to have made him, you know, even, even more indignant that he's in this situation, that this situation is happening. But this, is, this, was, this whole situation was inspired by Mary's humility and emotion about what happened. Jesus doesn't want to see you hurting. He doesn't like seeing you hurting. He doesn't like seeing you in these places. He doesn't. He allows it though. He does allow it. He allows you to go through the hurt. But he doesn't want to see you angry or bitter or full of attitude. He doesn't, he, he, does, he just wants to man, just be humble and come lowly to me. Come to my feet. And so eventually Mary found that, you know, she looked to Lazarus and received life. It didn't come in her own time, did it? Lazarus received life. That's what she was hoping for. That's what she wanted. That's what she was looking for. It took her honesty with Jesus and coming to his feet for that to happen. Humble to express her emotions in front of Jesus. Humble to be honest and say, hey, I'm a little upset with you. We wouldn't be here. You didn't keep your promise. If only. And here's the thing is, we can live the resurrected life that Jesus is talking about. We can live the life. But it has to be the Bible standard, not us. We can do that. But if only attitude, that won't get us there to the life. We can be honest about it. So go ahead and talk about the if only. It may be the place where we've been. It may be a launching pad to get to the light. But we can't stay there. 
It isn't going to be the place we sin. That is not what we're We're followers of Jesus. And so take heart and battle with our inner selves and battling with the scriptures and battling with our emotions and what's going on. But this, this, this battle, remember, it's already been won. It's already been won. Jesus has won it. It's, it's, it's a matter of your decision. And it's just a decision away. So, you know, decide today. There's two thoughts. Decide two things. That you're going to put away the if-only attitude by returning to the truth. Be honest about the if only. So man, yeah, if only it was this or that. Just, just talk about it. Talk about it with God. Talk about it with each other. But then, go back to the scripture. And the other thing is decide today that you will put your life at the feet of Jesus. And you will bow down to him. And you say, you're in control. You are Lord. I love that they still call them Lord. Even though they're a little upset with them. Even though they're a little disappointed. Even though they're hurt. They still call him Lord. And so trusting that God, we've got to trust that God has a great plan for our life. He's got a great plan for the church. He's got a great plan for Dayton. We must not understand. We might not understand it, but it's not really hard to understand. With hindsight, maybe we'll understand it, but in the moment, we might not. The resurrection and the life can be yours. So let's make some decisions today so God can be glorified right here in the Genesis. So to learn about Jesus, let's live like Jesus, and church, let's love like Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.